start off by doing a seat, which is just a piece of deal or whatever scrap timber you can find. Three seat posts. You put your first rib on, which is that one. That is your datum point. So all the rest of your ribs, you, you eye up from that. But once you've got your first rib on, you put a double gunnel, which goes round. That's a single piece, it's jointed here and another one here. Then you start to make up your stringers, fasten them through and then start weaving your ribs. You work it in and out, there's no nails at all involved at any point within the actual body of the boat. They're all just to secure the actual rims and secure the actual strips to the rim. The technique used at the rim is that of hook nailing. So we put a nail through here, the nail would protrude quite a lot. You then hold a hammer here at the back, hammer down the hook of the nail to actually hammer it back in to actually one of the strips, which is like this, but underneath the canvas. So the idea is that the friction of the lats lock and ball in place. So you, you start building up your basket. Uh, once you get the frame finished, your ribs and your stringers, you then put diagonals in at the corners, just so you don't have a large area of unsupported canvas. Um, once that's done, you would fasten it down to a board overnight. Remember, the lats are still damp. You keep wetting them out so they don't dry. Just use a watering can to slosh some water on. Um, overnight, you would, your building board is usually plywood. So you get some strips of scrap screw through so the boat will dry with a level bottom remember these lats because you're trying to twist them they're trying to return back to the original shape so if you don't capture the bottom when you come next morning you'll find you've got a concave dome, rather than a dome which is not life-threatening as soon as you put your weight on it straightens out but the object is to try and get as flat a bottom as you possibly can <clears throat> so once it's all dry, if you want at that stage, tidy it up with sandpaper and surf forms, whatever else. Give it a coat of clear cuprinol, which will extend the life of by four or five years. You can use the old-fashioned creosote or creosote substitute, but uh, anything, some people paint them before they put the calico covering on. Um, it's normally put on in one piece so you don't have any seams to, to bother with. So you pin it on front and back, side to side, and then gather it, it's stretched over the top. And once you've, uh, you've got your calico on, you then stitch the corners. You, you normally finish up with two pleats on each corner. So the idea is to tuck in the surplus and then stitch use a curved needle it makes it much easier some extra strong cotton so you're trying to gather in all the lumpy bumpy bits it's as soon as you wet out the calico it'll shrink it's like a dope effect so that it'll become quite tight some people would spray it with water leave it to dry so it's pretty shrunk and i just crack straight on using there's two types of bitumen paint. One is oil bound, which normally takes a day between coats to, to dry. But if you want to speed up the process, you can use now a emulsified bitumen, which is touch dry in half an hour. They call it a summer bitumen. It's not as durable as the, the oil bound stuff. But if you want to do a quick build, I mean, last month I did a build on, on Isla. Surely inside of it. Yeah. Maybe. yeah. To finish it off, we then put a finishing strip round that so it looks nicer and actually coat covers off so there's no points anywhere. But the, the nail is actually hooked in on itself to actually lock these strips in place. It's quite easy and they're quite lightweight to actually carry it, just lift up and carry. The fishermen themselves would tend to be, let me get it right, Dave, literally carry it like that on the back. You can have yeah, that over your shoulder that and you can literally walk. You carry that with you. Yeah, sure. you put that across your chest. And it's quite a lightweight and quite manoeuvrable. Yeah. You can yeah. do whatever you want with that. It's, it's a wonderful feeling, whether 
the, the flies are zipping past your face and your boat is booking and, and it's a great feeling you're so close to nature <coughs> and if you fall in of course you're even closer <laughs> going to step in backwards at the same time holding on to the boat so it doesn't shoot off so you'll take it out so it's just floating use your paddle as a crutch so stepping in you see the boat is locked until you get your weight onto the seat so you spread your feet so you lock the boat and we're going to punt out up the channel Taking your time. You're paddling over the front. I'm left handed, so my left hand goes on top of the crutch top, right hand with the thumb underneath, and you're doing a sculling stroke over the bow. And it doesn't want to be any more energetic than that because the boat will go at one speed. It doesn't go in straight lines, it waggles. So if you want to turn quickly. As you can see, it's quite maneuverable. You find on a day like this it's quite calm if the wind's blowing your body tends to act as a sail so it will carry you in the direction the wind is blowing you can if you wish use the wind to your advantage by carrying a golf brolly with you so you can pop the brolly up and use it as a, a sail that saves quite a bit of energy it's quite a leisurely stroke. I mean, you might be out fishing for two or three hours, so you want to conserve as much energy as you can. We know from cave paintings in Scandinavia and France that uh, boats are depicted from about 10,000 BC, but it's highly likely that uh, they go back even as far as the Ice Age. Um, current theory is that they probably started off in Scandinavia where they learned to stitch skins to make clothes and then tents and ultimately uh, boats so it's probably Lapland could be the cradle of these uh, skin on frame boats populous in Vietnam and there's one or two left in Tibet and India but uh, Wales is probably the most famous currently for Korrigals. There's three rivers in Wales, the Tywee, the Tyvee and the Taff, all in southwest Wales, where they can still purchase an annual license to fish with nets. There's only 20 licenses available and uh, the license holder, once he dies, it goes back to the river authorities and people have to reapply. Uh, they're allowed uh, three people per license. So effectively we've got uh, 60 coracle fishermen left in Wales. There's about 22 different types that we've found in the UK. Most of them obsolete since 1925 when the Fisheries Protection Act came in. People would build a coracle to suit the river conditions. And when I remember quite graphically one of the very old uh, coracle makers, uh, Bernard Thomas, who is now 92, I went down with my Shrewsbury and he said, why so big? I said, well, it's a copy of the original. And he said, well, his theory was that volume equals drag. The bigger the boat, the more you have to pull through the water. Some of the, the fastest flowing rivers like the Taff and uh, the Conway their boats are enormous but uh, because the river is so fast flowing so you want a big tank of a boat to uh, 
to make sure that you don't capsize. There is a chap down in Cornwall turned up at a Coracle Society meeting with a boat covered in craft paper. Again, he used, the craft paper is used for building, it's like a damp course, and he just covered it. Another chap at Ironbridge uh, on August bank holiday weekend came with a boat entirely built from stuff he'd scrounged from the river that flows through Oxford. The, um, the frame was made from plastic pipes. The seat was road barriers, plastic road barriers, and uh, the whole boat was covered in estate agents' uh, plastic boards. He just stapled them onto the frame and sealed the joints with gaffer tape. So it was entirely, cost him nothing at all, apart from his ingenuity, and, uh, and it floated. It's not something I hope was going to catch on, because <laughs> if everybody wants to start foraging for materials, there'll be nothing left for the coracle makers. But that's basically what uh, coracles are about. People get quite twitchy about them, particularly the people who think they're the experts. As far as I'm concerned, a coracle is just a basket to hold water out, keep your feet dry. It doesn't have to be pretty. You find a lot of the Welsh fishing boats are virtually cobbled together over a weekend. They don't care about fancy seams and stuff. They just use bits of wire to fasten it onto the frame and uh, whack some pitch on and you can have yourself a boat built over a weekend. Uh, they're very easy to use with a fishing rod and uh, you can stick them on your car roof rack. You'll get into places with overhanging trees where you couldn't swing a rod. You certainly get in with a coracle. For lake fishing, they're absolutely idyllic. Get yourself a jet ski anchor where you open the flukes, just throw it into the lake. The wind will blow you around in the circle. So getting out, you, you pull in as far as you possibly can to the bank. You'll find as soon as you stand up, the boat is locked. And then get out very quickly. Make sure the boat doesn't shoot away. If you want, you can put your feet up. But uh, this is a... You can relax with your old pina colada. And on a, a nice fine day, there's nothing better. <laughs> okay. <laughs>